and welcome to another episode of the Astrology Witch Podcast. My name is Tiana and I will be your host. And if you're here again, thanks so much for listening in. I appreciate it. So today we're going to talk about the different planets in astrology and what they're ruled by. And I'm also going to go over the um, sun, moon, and ascendant, also known as the rising Um, and the rising is typically one of your chart rulers, but we'll go over that as well. So let's go ahead and get started because it's quite a bit of information. Okay, so what is the ascendant or the rising sign? Uh, So typically the ascendant or the rising sign is the first house in your chart or or any person's chart, Uh, and that's what your rising will be. So if you're looking at your chart, and and you want to know what your ascendant or rising sign is, it typically falls in the first house. So what does the ascendant or the rising represent? The ascendant or the rising represents your social mask, your social filter, how you come across to other people or how people perceive you at a first glance when they first meet you, uh, before they really understand who you are or they've gotten to know you a little bit better. Um, It's sort of like looking through... (laughs) a window at you if you were inside of the window and the window was your ascendant. Um, So uh, one of the things about the ascendant is that oftentimes since this is what people think about you at first glance, um, and it might even be if it's a strong enough influence what uh, you identify with the most. So because it's your chart ruler, if that makes sense. So oftentimes, this is actually why people don't identify with their sun sign, uh, because they have a very strong chart ruler, because they have a stellium in a, a we'll go over what that is. It's essentially a, a bunch of planets in one sign or in one house. Um, and that can affect how you feel about yourself, like what kind of personality you have. And if your son's in one house, then you have a bunch of other plants in another house, well, you'd feel totally different. Okay, so chart ruler. The chart ruler is the planet that rules the ascendant sign. And we're going to go over planets and what rules them as we go through each planet. So I don't want to go through that just yet. But the ascendant kind of gives us an idea of how to organize Um, a personality because the rising sign it gives everyone a sort of center from which they radiate out okay Uh, and the ruler of the ascendant it takes that centering of a personality by giving us an idea of identity overall which would be a the main influences would be a mix of your ascendant your rising your sun and your moon those are going to be the biggest strongest uh, influences in your chart. And so uh, you can see that if somebody, for instance, has an Aries rising, but maybe they're a Libra, they're going to come off a lot more direct and aggressive. They might not come off as a Libra because Aries is actually the opposite sign to Libra. um, And they're sort of polar opposites in terms of their approach. So even though, yes, you're a Libra, you might read your typical cosmopolitan um, horoscope and be like, that's not me at all, (laughs) because you have an Aries rising. So let's talk about planet rulers. So Aries is ruled by Mars, and Mars is the planet of war, (laughs) essentially. Uh, But it's also the planet of like ambition and passion and energy. Taurus is ruled by Venus. Gemini is ruled by Mercury. Cancer is ruled by the moon. Leo is ruled by the sun. Virgo is ruled by Mercury. Libra is ruled by Venus. Scorpio is traditionally Mars, but uh, nowadays, if you're a more modern astrologist, they're ruled by Pluto. Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. Aquarius, old the OG ruler is Saturn, but the new ruler is Uranus. And Pisces, the OG ruler is Jupiter, but the new ruler is Neptune. So those are the planet rulers for each sign. And we're going to go through the different planets, as I said, so you can understand kind of what that means for you if you're a Virgo and you're ruled by Mercury. Well, what does Mercury represent? Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the planets because it's quite a bit of stuff to go through. So we're going to start with Mercury. Mercury is the messenger of the gods in uh, Roman mythology. 
And so they rule all the things that rule messages like communication, intelligence, data, um, talking, teaching, writing, any kind of communication, listening, learning, reading, observing, critical thinking skills, uh, the reception of information to essentially absorb all the information. So if you're a Virgo, you are the analyzer, the critical thinker, the, um, the person that can take in all the details when it comes to information and sort of organize those things in a very critical um, fashion. If you're a Gemini, uh, they say that Geminis are gifted with the gift of gab or that, you know, they're talkers. They often get painted as gossips, as stereotypes, and it's because they understand how to sort of <laughs> take all this information in a bunch of different topics and sort of spit it back out again. Um, but it, that's not to say that they're not just as intelligent as a Virgo. They just might not be as organized depending on what else is in their chart. Okay, so then we have Venus, and Venus is the goddess of love and peace and the arts, a bunch of other things as well. Uh, but those are the main ones that kind of get stereotyped for. Um, and also, honestly, <laughs> I would say of like jealousy and lust and passion, those things. Uh, but, you know, the function of this, if you're a Taurus or, say, a Libra, would be like the inner peace or calm. Um, stability, support, um, emotional relation, not relationships, but emotional bonds that we form, right? Like, like romance or friendship, uh, the development of making aesthetics, uh, is kind of the, it plays into that, that aesthetic love or the arts or balance. Okay. And this kind of plays into Taurus and Libra, right? Because Taurus is that sort of like that natural romance, that love of creativity and the arts, um, but it's also that possessive kind of jealous love as well in like a more toxic, unevolved light. And Libra being ruled by Venus is more of an organized intellectual sort of because it's air and air rules intelligence. So it kind of expresses Venus in a different way. It's more cerebral. It will express Libra or sorry, Venus in a more balanced, harmonizing, um, aesthetic beauty. And not to say that Taurus doesn't enjoy aesthetic beauty, but Taurus is more like the nature lover and love you as you are, <laughs> um, you know, more primal and almost feral uh, love of beauty, you know, like the beauty that's in a wild ass forest, like that's beautiful, but it could also murder you. And whereas like Libra is like, I love that this is super symmetrical. It's more like the Fibonacci sequence or like the fact that butterfly wings are symmetrical and they're beautiful because they're this perfect illustration of balance or like, you know, interior design, that kind of thing. And so the next planet we're going to talk about is Mars. Mars is the god of war in Roman mythology. Um, and it typically rules over all the things that we think about, like war, the battle spirit, um, and that energy and ambition, um, the development of your own personal will and courage and assertion. So Mars rules all of those things. So if you have Aries in a placement or Aries sun or whatever, you know, then you would have that God of war mentality that I'm just going to go after what I'm going to go after. Cause I have that mentality of, being assertive, asserting my will on others or on things or using an expression of courage to get the things that I want. And that goes into physical um, expressions, you know, so that's why you have a lot of people, if they have a lot of Mars in their chart, or if Mars is their chart ruler, they might be very active, very athletic. Uh, they might just have a lot of energy too, like they can't sit still. <laughs> And uh, they might even be aggressive, uh, not necessarily like they're like going to punch you in the face or something, but they might be like, you know, that super overbearing personality, very strong personality. They might be strong willed. They might have, again, a lot of energy. They might be super ambitious. Um, again, the traditional ruler of Scorpio is also Mars. So they have that same kind of energy about them, but it's in like a watery way, whereas Aries is fire. So you can see these playing out sort of differently, even though they are ruled by the same planets. Okay, so the next planet is Jupiter. Jupiter is the king of the gods. It's known as the great benefic in the sky, and it brings luck and expansion and growth to whatever it touches. Obviously, this can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what it's expanding and growing, right? 
Um, but it's it's faith in that things are inherently good. It's the development of confidence and joy and optimism. It's like the lifting of your spirit. Um, and it sort of gifts good luck in that placement, wherever it is. It just depends on if it's um, debilitated or not, but we'll get to that when we get into houses. Uh, but essentially, Jupiter can bring luck and whatever sign you have it in and what placement you have it in, it can tell you how you are lucky, how you are gifted, how you are most fortunate, and how you can expand. Uh, you know, I have my Jupiter in Gemini, so I am lucky and expand <laughs> by sort of acting like a Gemini and doing Gemini-ish things, you know, maybe being very social and being friendly, um, having a lot of social circles, networking, absorbing a lot of different topics and information, kind of doing the things that Gemini does. And I have it, I think, in my sixth house. Um, so I would do that in the area of, actually, I think it's my seventh house. So I would do that in the area of relationships, maybe, or health if it was in the sixth house. But so that it can affect different areas of your life depending on where it is. Just as an example. Okay, so the next house is Saturn. And Saturn is the Lord of Solitude. It's the great malefic. It's the Lord of Restrictions, Structures and karmic lessons. And so I know people don't like to hear about restrictions, but I mean, structures in themselves can be a really good thing. You want a structure to be there if you're dealing with something chaotic, even though maybe inherently doesn't sound that great. Like we need those so that everything isn't utter chaos. And so it really rules self-discipline, growth, self-respect, faith in your own destiny or your own it's it's like the combination of will but with limitations um and also understanding solitude then we have uranus uh uranus is the sort of chaos god in the sky the god of earthquakes and lightning bolts um it's quick it rules quick change and sort of yeah chaos and unpredictability it's the development of your individuality and your own unique spirit the truest most authentic version of yourself and the capacity to question authority and structure and understanding like it's like a higher wisdom uh, in fact it's the higher octave of um neptune i want to say um okay so then we're going to move on to Neptune. <laughs> Neptune is the god of the sea. The little trident is how you can find it on your charts, a little trident glyph. And Neptune rules dreams, aspirations, imagination. It does rule creativity, but like the dreamy creativity, the kind that's like in your head that helps you create anything from nothing. Um, it's the also the decentralization of your ego. So it's like where, um, you know, Venus rules love and Neptune, which, you know, Pisces rules, is kind of like that unconditional love. And it's also because it's watery. It's like that sea of consciousness. So if we can put it into that perspective, it's the creation of a point of self-observation that has nothing to do with your ego. It's like objectively seeing yourself without having to think about your own ego um and it's it's you know breaking down barriers whereas saturn builds barriers and separates things into strict constructed categories neptune is like the dissolving of everything and understanding that we're all connected and that everything is connected and your ego means nothing and your soul is this and you're on this higher plane of awareness and so it's the development of an awareness of a higher power or god or spirit or gods or whatever you believe in and then we have the planet Pluto. Pluto is the god of hell, lord of the underworld, death, resurrection, sex, and transformation. It can be the realization of somebody's desti- destiny. Excuse me. Um, it's sort of like a, it can be the house of occult knowledge, secrets, your shadow, um, the darker aspects of yourself, how you die and are resurrected, how you transmute or transform yourself. Um, and... It, it can also be uh, discernment of the truth and developing 
uh, an understanding of your own ego and how it's all sort of meaningless in the grand scope of the world. It can also be the wounding and healing of your wounds, which is sort of weird existential topic to talk about, but it, it, it's known, uh, the house ruled by Pluto is the 12th house, and it's known as the house of your undoing, which everyone is terrified by, uh, but essentially talks about uh, the things that we must integrate into ourselves if you believe in union uh, concepts, the things that we must ultimately face about ourselves, the truths that we must face about ourselves, the wounds that we must heal. Um, and uh, again, sort of like the lessons we must learn with Saturn kind of has that sort of similar feel, um, but more, you know, I guess existential lessons that help us heal the deep-seated wounds of our lifetime. So those are the planets. <laughs> and now we're going to talk about what the sun and the moon mean in the grand scope of your chart. So the, so the ascendant is, again, if you were standing behind a window, then the window itself is your ascendant sign. It's like what people see about you first it's all the window panes and the structure and the frame and everything, but it might not, it's not necessarily who you are, but it can be your outfacing uh, identity. And you might really identify again with your uh, ascendant or rising sign because that is center, it's the center point of your identity, even if it's not your ego, which is your sun or your, you know, your heart or soul, which would be your moon. Um, those things kind of ground your entire chart because they're going to be the three strongest influences of your chart and the ascendant again would be like the superficial layer of your personality and then everything underneath your sun and moon and all the other planets would kind of bring everything together um so the moon sign actually let's start with the sun i lied okay so this sun sign your sun sign really talks about your ego and how it's like your your heart identity, who you really are. And it is also sort of the ego identity. It's um, how you identify yourself, even if other people don't see that about you, or maybe only people who know you very well will see those things about you. And the moon on the flip side of that is your heart, your soul, your feelings, your emotions. It might not even be things that people see about you. Um, and it's not objective reality. It's subjective reality because it's your emotions. It's how you feel about things. And whereas your sun is like how you see things and your perspective and it's subjective reality, but it's subjective reality based on your ego and the way that you see the world, uh, not necessarily the way the world is. The moon sign is your instincts. It's going to be subconscious, reflexive behavior, things that you never talk about. Or, I mean, if you're incredibly self-aware, maybe you do. Or if you have the same sun and moon, like you'd be a completely <laughs> not, um, what is it called? Not a person fighting yourself. You would definitely be like of one heart and mind, and that would be the dream. Uh, but most people don't have that, unless you're incredibly lucky, I think. So your moon sign could be something complete opposite to your sun sign and your rising. And people might not even understand that about you. You might be the only one or people who know you very well would be the only ones to see this about your personality. Um, it's sort of the mood that you take on. And if you take care of the emotional needs and well-being of a moon sign, it can be sort of like unlocking the key to how to nurture yourself and take care of yourself. And also um, nurturing your sun is like nurturing your ego. It helps you shine in the world, just like your sun helps you shine. Wherever you have your sun in a house or a placement, um, those are the ways that can help you shine. Okay, so now that we've gone through the planets a little bit, I thought we would go through the houses. So this is going to take a lot, the majority of this podcast episode, and I didn't think that I would get to it in this episode, to be honest with you, but we're rolling through this real quick. So I'm thinking maybe I, uh, if you guys want to, and you can let me know uh, if that's something that you desire to have as an episode in the future, I can do an episode on each house and each planet 
if that's something you care to know about. Uh, or I can do each house and what effect it would have if you had that planet, like through the planets, basically like first house, which would be your rising or an ascendant. And I can go through all the signs of what it would be like to have that in, that as an ascendant in your first. So let me know on Instagram. Um, it's at Astrology Witch Podcast or um, Astro I think it's Astro W podcast on Twitter. Let me know if you want those as episodes and I will do those in the future because we can definitely get deeper into this as we go. But I thought it's best to start with the basics. So we're going to go through the basics of all the houses now. Okay, so the first house, it's your ascendant, your rising. Again, it's the window pane. Uh, If you're standing behind it, then the window pane is the ascendant rising. And it's the establishment of personal identity and what other people see, your public-facing personality. And it's sort of the decisiveness of your own actions, a sense of control, which would be, you, you kind of, it's like the steering wheel of your life, of your own personal identity. Um, and again, it, it can be your public-facing personality. It can influence your 10th house, which definitely is your public-facing uh identity but also career um so it can definitely influence how you play that out Uh, but also it it rules um how you felt maybe growing up depending on what sign you have it in um and how your personality has developed it can say a lot about how you grew up what your childhood was like and also um how you felt you needed to act okay the second house house of money value and also personal self-esteem Uh, It can be challenging to your self-confidence depending on what you have in this house. And it can also be like money and possessions because the second house is uh, typically ruled by Taurus. The first house is typically ruled by Aries, which is why it's your Um, self-identity. Or sorry, Aries rules the the self. So the second house, house of money, which makes sense because it's ruled by Taurus, and value so you're going to be dealing with your possessions your resources your own personal ones though not other people's uh and it rules your confidence your self-esteem it's based on literal material results and self-development and it's the management of those resources and how you would approach those things depending on what sign you have in this house would be how you approach money resources your own self-confidence your own possessions how how important they are how not important they are um and it can also lead to like materialism or equating self-worth with 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 how much you have how many possessions you have how much money you have Uh, it can lead to a lack of self-respect or a fear of risk being overly concerned with material security and it it depends on how successfully you navigate these houses and what placements you have whether or not they're in a an exalted placement, a strong placement, debilitated placement, uh, and what is, you know, aspecting that. But we can get into that in another episode. Okay, so third house, house of communication. This is ruled by Gemini, and so we got Mercury influencing this house of communications. This is how you communicate information with others, how you gather information, how you share information. Uh, It can be clear unbiased perception and a willingness to tolerate like ambiguity in uncertainty in communication and how people perceive things, the capacity to understand more information, both verbally, intellectually, and on an emotional level, um, if it's done well. And then there's also the concept of needing to protect and be defensive and intellectualize things and how you might feel the need to have intellectual battles with other people or how you feel confused and scattered when it comes to communicating with others uh, and dispersing that energy and not necessarily being an effective communicator depending on what is in this house. The fourth house is the house of home and it's ruled by cancer so it makes sense right? Okay so this is the unconscious emotional uh, it's sort of like the underpinnings of your personality that you don't think about, domestic life, home life. This can be like everything you think about home and that home should be, how you approach your home if you care about having a home. (laughs) It's an understanding of your own motivations, needs, and fears, the establishment of your roots, 
family, home, inner self, and what those things should look like based on what is here. Uh, It can also be like a lack of self-awareness or neurosis, uh, unsatisfying obsessive behavior, self-absorption to the point of withdrawal, depending on what is in this house. Fifth house ruled by Leo, it's a house of creativity and children. Um, It's the house of pleasure and playfulness and creative self-expression and falling in love and shining for the sake of shining and joy. Uh, It's like the joyous excitement for each day, the development of your creative outlets uh, through which you can express yourself. And if it's debilitated, it can be self-destructive or maybe like indulgent pleasures that, you know, kind of mess you up, having creative blockages, the inability to relax and enjoy the moment. Uh, But again, it just depends what's here. Sixth house is the house of service, and it's ruled by Virgo. It's also considered the house of servants. Uh, So it rules your responsibility, your skills and competence, the devotion and self-sacrifice, and it can even rule martyrdom uh, and, you know, being like a wage slave, like someone who just works for the sake of endless busyness <laughs> so that they have tasks but they have no personal meaning to that person or being subordinate in every relationship that you have uh, and overcoming that would be you know finding fulfillment through the development of meaningful skills and crafts that you find of value to yourself and others okay so the seventh house is the house of partnerships and it's ruled by libra it's all that also the house of marriage and sometimes astrologers will look to the seventh house. If you can hear that siren, then I'm sorry, but I live in the ghetto. (laughs) Anyway, um, so it is the house of partnerships and marriage and your relationships with other people and how you interact with others, how you go about those relationships. And again, astrologers will sometimes look to the seventh house to see uh, who you would be and what types of personalities you would be compatible with. It's your intimate relationships, your how you identify with others. Uh, do you characterize them by equality and openness or in having a special connection? Or do you have pa- patterns of submissiveness, directness, or uh, control? Or do you have an inability to form emotional bonds? Do you have a fear of intimacy or dependency um, or a fear of dependency? All of these things will show up in the seventh house. And aspected to other things will show how you are either helped or hindered. (laughs) And I think the important thing too, is there are a lot of people out there that have told me, oh, you know, my chart is shit. (laughs) And the reality is every chart has good things and bad things about it. We all have strengths and weaknesses. We all have areas that we have done a lot of work in, that we show a lot of growth in, and we have areas that we need to grow in. And that is everyone's unique journey or soul's journey or karmic journey, depending on you know what your personal beliefs about it are. And so I would say that if you feel your chart is specifically challenging uh, or particularly challenging to you, then understand that also every chart to each person is particularly challenging and you're up for the challenge. Okay, so we're moving on to the eighth house. The eighth house is the house of regeneration. It's ruled by Scorpio. It's also the house of death and the occult and secrets and sex and taboo uh, and emotionally charged materials and taboo topics. You know, death, sex, and the occult are pretty taboo. In a healthy uh, situation, it would be spontaneous sexuality, um, passion, the acceptance of death, and integrating that with it being a fact of life, and the sense of immortality of a person's consciousness, magic, and uh, also unsuccessfully integrated would be block sexuality, obsessive sexuality, a fear of death or denial of death, rigid denial of religion or the occult or mystical magical feelings. So depending on what you have in the eighth house. (laughs) In the ninth house, which is ruled 
by Sagittarius, it's the house of mental exploration and long journeys, usually over water. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> it's a thing. Um, this can be the confrontation with mechanical routine aspects of life, the formation of a personal system of ethics, a philosophy, because Sagittarius are the philosophers of the Zodiac, and encounters with the unpredictable and exotic, which is why it rolls long journeys over water to new places and un known terrain. <laughs> it's the ability to break up our routines and create new patterns of behavior and to explore creative expression and new philosophies and understandings of the world by breaking up those routines and patterns of behavior through possibly travel or um, even travel through things like higher learning or um, education or going to I mean, you could travel to a place locally, but this most likely ninth house refers to far travels. So traveling to some place you've never been before in a culture that's completely different from your own, or even experiencing that culture, maybe locally, but in a way that is completely opposite to your own, that makes you see the world in a new light. It gives a clear individual sense of life's evolving meaning and purpose. And obviously, if it's a harder placement, it can be routine and boredom or being rigid in terms of how you think, uh, dogmatism, being dogmatic in your thinking, opportunistic, narrow-minded, or unprincipled, being a nihilist. All those things can show up in the ninth house. Okay, so the tenth house is ruled by Capricorn, of course, because it's the house of career and jobs and what your work will be like. And it's also your reputation. So that's why I said that the first house, which is your sort of surface level personal identity and what people might see as your social mask, that can influence your 10th house because your 10th house is your reputation, your career, your position and status in society, your destiny to some extent. It's the self-expressive, personally satisfying status in your own community. It can rule what careers, what type of careers you might be uh, really good at. The sense of fulfilling your own destiny is sort of in the 10th house, which is the highest point of your chart, usually. Uh, and uh, so it's the pinnacle of you know career success if you will. But it can also be entrapping yourself in meaningless, alienating social roles that don't necessarily serve you because you have an obsession with power, status, or appearances. So good, bad, all of the above. And there are ways to empower every house. So even if you had like a debilitating uh, placement, then don't worry. There are other ways to work with that placement in a way that fulfills it so that it's not holding you back. But again, depending on what planet you have here, what sign you have here, um, it can say a lot about what kind of careers you would be good in and where you would do well. And there are many different houses that can t sort of say what you would be good at. You can actually look at a whole person's chart or a person's whole chart and see what they might have um, affinity toward because there are different skills for different houses. Okay, so the 11th house is the house of friends and it's ruled by Aquarius. It's also the house of hopes, like hopes, dreams, wishes, future plans, goals, life themes, um, how you identify with different groups, organizations, movements, or associations like your, your soul tribe, uh, because Aquarius rules humanity and like the larger world of society. And it can give you a concrete sense of direction in life, realistic, inspiring goals rooted in your own self-knowledge, the network of relationships that support those goals. Uh, and obviously, if it's in a debilitated place, then it can be the vagueness of those things, the lack of purpose, drifting, inability to make a commitment at any level, unrealistic, whimsical goals that go nowhere, friends and associates who only contribute to this drifting. And again, if you have that placement, you get someone to read your chart, or if you figure out how to read your own chart, you can figure out, okay, this placement is debilitated. How do I work with this in a way that's more productive and positive? Okay, so we've reached the 12th house, the house of troubles, or the house of self-undoing, as I said, and it's ruled by Pisces. And um, that's, you know, again, Neptune, Jupiter, uh, rulership. It's consciousness itself. It's 
the events and experiences that disrupt our identification with our own personality. It's like an ego death. It's like nothing means, everything means nothing because this is, this life is all an illusion type thoughts. Self-transcendence in a positive light. Um, it can be freedom from worry about, you know, the ups and downs of life because in the grand scope of things, I am a, an immortal soul that can never die. <laughs> Spiritual and psychic experiences, meditation, intuition, uh, feeling the presence of God and higher levels of consciousness in a debilitated state. It can make you confused, uncertain, have a blurry self-image, be an escapist, abusive, self-destructive person who has self-destructive relationships or who is a perpetual victim, who has addiction problems that can show up here with alcohol, food, sleep, sex, television, or other drugs, hypersensitivity, mental imbalances, or chronic bad luck. So those are all of the houses <laughs> and they have many more meanings, but I thought I would keep it fairly simple for you guys so we don't get too wrapped up in each house because I think I can definitely do um, a- entire episodes on one particular house and what that house represents and also how different planets or um signs in that placement can affect it if you guys would like to hear that so definitely let me know Um, and also it's important to understand that each house and placement and planet like if you have if your rising sign or your first house is yourself and it's in hypothetically Aries which would be really natural because Aries rules the first house, so you'd be very comfortable there. Uh, if that rules your first house, then if it also depends. This is why degrees are important. So once you understand the basics, then degrees will become more important because you'll understand that if it's at a certain level of degree, if it's a very high degree, meaning like 29 degrees or whatever, which is the highest degree it could be, the, the most authentic of that sign, the most that sign that it could be, <laughs> Um, then it will bleed into the other house. So you might be in Aries rising with Taurus in the second house, but uh, which would be supernatural placement, but uh, Aries will still bleed into that second house, if that makes sense, because it's in such a high degree. And if it's in a low degree, it might bleed back into your 12th house. And that's kind of how you can look at the different placements that you have in different houses, if you see that it's almost at zero degrees or it's at a really low degree, it can bleed into the previous house. And if it has a higher degree, it can bleed into the next house and it can sort of affect how that is expressed. And if you have multiple things in that house, well, it's gonna take you a little bit more time to understand how they all coexist and affect one another because you have all these influences in the same thing. It can also make you a very consistent person though. For instance, if you have your sun and moon and your Mercury and your Venus all in Scorpio, (laughs) for example, you would be like of one heart, of one mind. Uh, You would communicate exactly what you mean, mean exactly what you say. Uh, And maybe not if you're a Scorpio, Uh, you'd be hiding that shit. But (laughs) you know, whatever you did actually say, you would definitely mean uh, and you wouldn't have conflict within yourself and you wouldn't be saying things that you don't necessarily think and you would communicate exactly the way that you think and the way that you feel and love the exact same way that you think, feel and communicate, (laughs) which would be wild. So in a way, it makes a very consistent person who has all these placements in one area, but it can also be overwhelming, right? Like say if you had all those placements in cancer, that can feel like you're on an emotional roller coaster constantly because you're such a deeply intuitive and feeling water sign that the world could feel completely overwhelming if you didn't have like a, an extreme level of self-care that uh, nurtured your own personality. You'd be like feeling like a perpetual victim maybe even if you had so much going on there. So those are the different ways in which your house placements and planets can sort of affect the different aspects of a person's personality, the person's chart. And you'll notice that there are certain dominant rulers other than the first house. Uh, Again, if you had a bunch of planets in one house, in one planet, one sign, um, then 
you would notice that you have a lot of heavy influences in certain areas. And then other areas where you have nothing, either it's going to be a lot simpler, a lot more complicated. You might feel like there's nothing going on there for you. (laughs) Maybe you're like, you know, you got three major themes in your life or attitudes of how your personality plays out in life. And, you know, those are the different ways that it can play out in a person's needle chart. So this episode is obviously going to be a little bit shorter than my previous episode, which went through every single sign. Um, But I wanted to give you all an idea of just the quick breakdown of what the houses are about, you know, on a vague stance and a positive and negative, depending on what's there, and a quick breakdown of all the planets and what the meanings are and, again, what they essentially can represent on a very simple surface level so that we can all start getting an idea of what they represent if you're new to astrology. So I hope that you guys found this helpful. And if you did, please let me know on Instagram at Astrology Witch Podcast or on Twitter at Astro W Podcast. I will put it in the uh, description for you guys because it's a new Twitter account and I couldn't remember like exactly what it was. I think the one that I wanted was taken. Um, but I will link it down below if you guys want to chat to me or shoot me a DM or something or tweet me. That would be amazing and it'd be very helpful to hear from you what you're interested in learning about when it comes to astrology because I love talking about it um, and it'd be great if I could get your input. And I think at some point too, it would be cool to do a an episode about um, relationship compatibility, not just for romance, but also for friendship. So if you're interested in that, I think that'd be a cool episode to do. And then also career, because those are the main things I feel people want to know about when it comes to their chart, is career compatibility or what careers they would be good at, and also um, relationship compatibility. So let me know if you would like to have those as future episodes, again, on Instagram and Twitter, which I will link below in the description, and I will make those a reality. I hope you guys are doing well. And I hope you're having a very good day wherever you are or night, wherever you are. It's like evening where I'm at. (laughs) So hopefully you found this helpful. And if you did, again, please let me know your feedback. I really appreciate it. And I will see you in the next episode. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next time.